it now gives me great pleasure and it's truly an honor to introduce to you our next speaker. First, formally, you should know Michael J. Matt is the editor of the Remnant newspaper, traditional Catholicism's oldest journal, and his family has been publishing Catholic newspapers for 150 years. Wow. He's founder of Remnant TV and the host of the Remnant Underground, its most popular show and podcast. And since 2000, Michael has been U.S. coordinator for Notre Dame de Chrétienté in Paris, the organization responsible for the Pentecost pilgrimage to Chartres, France. And he has led the U.S. contingent on the pilgrimage to Chartres since 1990. A quick aside, Michael asked me many, many times to go on that. I always said no. And then last year when I was speaking at the, at the Catholic Identity Conference, which he also runs, uh, he they put out this video, oh my goodness, with the history and the glory of the Shark pilgrimage. And right there, I knew right away, I just see Michael, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go now. Um, and um, yeah, four of my older kids decided to go as well. And then my wife said, wait, you going with the, no, 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 just coming. So we went, um, not as a whole family, but as many as you can go. Anyway, beautiful. Like many of my friends who have gone on such things before said, it was brutal. It was good. <laughs> Michael regularly delivers addresses and conferences to Catholic and conservative groups about the Catholic counter-revolution, politics, the culture question, and the social reign of Christ the King. Together with his wife and their seven children, Michael Mack currently resides in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I want to... <clears throat> he's got his little team with him. Tess Mullins behind the camera. And Walter Willis, excuse me, <laughs> Walter Willis. I'm thinking Walter because we have a Walter video guy as well. But Walter is um, um, is very interesting. Let me tell you another quick aside before I let him up here. Michael and I were both called, as well as many other Catholic leaders, to come to Munich and to there demonstrate against what they were doing in Germany against the Church and against faith. And um, Michael was there. But it was surprising because everybody had heard there was some big accident at home. And he got there and I met him in the square and I said, hey, Michael, how's it going? And what happened and what happened? Well, he had had the news that his son was hit by a train and uh, one of his, I think he was told, legs was amputated or something. <coughs> I was like, what are you doing here? And he said, my son told me Dad, you need to go. The dedication of family members to the mission of Christ and his church, even in the lay apostolates, is stunning. My wife is standing at the back of the room. She's mother of eight children. And our, our little guy, Zach, because he's the only one left at home now. I want to thank the family members That's an amazing thing to do, to offer your suffering for what your dad is doing. And I know there's many, many sacrifices of all of our spouses and loved ones who put up with us doing a lot of things that seem pretty crazy in the world. Honestly, from the bottom of my heart, Walter, thank you for your example. My <laughs> is amazing to and that is truly the best thing to to my family. Thank you so much, uh, John Henry, uh, for that most gracious uh, invitation. You know, we, we go back a ways now, and uh, it's always an honor and a privilege for me to stand with you and your heroic fight over the years for life, for tradition, for the church. LifeSight is tearing it up. LifeSight is doing such great work, and it's a true, truly an honor to be here. So thank you for that kind introduction. I also wanted to thank John. See, the thing is, I, I did, don't really have a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of, of a prepared script today because I wanted to be able to react to you to honor this conference in real time with a from the heart reaction to everything I've seen here working in the Vatican press office for the past 10 days. 
And I thought perhaps that would be my, my contribution to you, having had eyes and ears on what was going on, what we in the press were being told uh, was happening. Um, and so I want to share that. I share that some of, some of that with you in sort of an informal way, maybe a bit of a conversational way here for the next 45 minutes. But I also want to tell you that it's really amazing um, spending time in the Synod Hall. And I didn't expect this to happen to me, but it has. And so I want to thank John Henry again for setting up this space. <laughs> because I have learned so much about space. <laughs> and this is a space where we can not only talk and communicate, listen. but we can listen. <laughs> and, accompany. and accompany each other in our journey. Inspired by the Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I feel the Spirit is all around us. It has been, I, I jest, but I'm, I'm not jesting now when I say, it has been, and I mean this with all respect in the world, mind-numbingly stupid what's been going on during this synod. Mind you, I'm not saying that they, that the men and women involved here, the synod fathers and mothers are stupid, but I do feel there's a plan of organized, orchestrated stupidity being laid out for us, for all of us. And by us, I mean the world, the Catholic world, having the press actually pass along the stupidity as nothing actually is being said that makes any sense. So I want to, I want to tell you that that's, where I'm coming from, so if I seem a little punch drunk, I'm, I'm amazed by, by some of the expert journalists, some of who are in this room, who do, do this on a regular basis. I only have temporary accreditation, and Lord, Lord knows that's, that's plenty for me. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to get back home and see my wife and children and see sane people again, and you, sane people here in this room. So um, it really has been amazing. I want to try to share some of it with you. And before I say that, I want to also, in all seriousness, thank, um, just tell you how, how humbled I feel at this moment to be following up, oh my goodness, Bishop Joseph Strickland and Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Gerhard Muller. Um, in fact, to steal my own thunder, I'm going to conclude with my own personal opinion uh, about what that means to the movement, because I've been involved with this movement all my life, and it is, you are, so those of you who are new to this, and I know many people are because of COVID, you're new to this movement, you have no idea the consolation that God has given you, because you just don't have it much to compare, right, to, to the way things were. In the 1970s, when I, was a, when I was a child, there was one bishop, and you know who I'm speaking about, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who stood up and resisted, and that was it, and he was far away, and there was no internet, and there was no email, and we were down in the catacombs trying to survive, and it was terrifying. It was terrifying in the sense that you didn't see, humanly speaking, how this would ever be resolved. That being said, it was also in the catacombs that we learned to live the faith, and more importantly, that we learned to love the faith. But I really want to stress, young people here today, people who are new to this movement, get down on your knees tonight and thank God for the grace that we all have been given today by hearing the words of Cardinal Muller, by hearing the words of Bishop Strickland, hearing the example of Cardinal, Cardinal Burke and the resistance that he, that, he, that, he, that he raised early on, this is a tremendous grace. I was going to say this till the end, but because I don't have a prepared speech, I want, to, I want to say it now, that there has been over the years this concern. Are we more Catholic than the Pope? Who are you to judge? Well, more Catholic than the Pope. We probably all are at this point. God, God help us. But who are you to judge? Who died and made you judge and jury of the Pope and the church and the bishops and everything else? How, do you, how dare you resist? How dare you as a mere layman resist? So I want to point out a statement of the obvious uh, that probably has occurred to many of you. But it has to do with what Cardinal Muller said pretty much exactly one year ago. In God's providence, we were prepared for what's happening today. And we want to talk strategy today. But we were prepared by a prince of the church who sat on the World Over program with Raymond Arroyo on EWTN one year ago, and he said this synod is going to be, as he saw it unfolding at that point, he said it's a hostile takeover of the Catholic Church. 
And then he said something very important to each one of us in this room. He said, and I quote very simply, and we must resist. And what that does for every one of us is it gives us the marching orders that we need. A prince of the church has told all of us, you must resist. So when we face the divine judgment seat of Almighty God, we have a built-in excuse. We had princes of the church, top-rate theologians. You saw him speak today. Holy men, real theologians, who are looking at the situation today. And they said, you must resist. He said, you must resist. We, in other words, we're off the hook. We also are now obligated before God to resist. And people tell us that what we should be doing is perhaps joining the Orthodox. That what we should do is leave the church. If you feel this way, get out. Don't love the church, leave it then. They tell us that things have changed, and that there's a new order in the church, and if we can't keep up with it, then get out of the church. Friends, I, got, I, have, a, I have something to say about that as a, as a cradle Catholic, as I know many of you are. How dare they? How dare they come out and tell us that we should leave the church? that we should be driven out of our mother, out of, the, out of the arms of our loving mother. They are the ones who've changed. We've changed nothing. We have accepted the faith as it was given to us by our fathers, and it is our obligation before God to hand it down to our sons and daughters as it was given to us. We will never leave the faith. But it's very important now as we go into this next year of synodality and we're going to be confronted constantly because the apparent authority of the church is changing the church. So we are the troublemakers. And it's very important that we make it clear why we fight. We fight out of obligation before God and history and our children because we are put here at this moment in time for a reason. God has given us a light. He has given us the, the, the ability to see what millions have not seen, so it comes with an obligation. But don't forget what motivates us more than anything else. What motivates each and every one of us more than anything else is love. When you think what the church has given you, when you think what the church has given all of us, when you think when you were a child and the great feasts, Christmas and Easter and family. The church was with us the entire time. I am offended when they say that they are going to accompany us now. The church has been accompanying me and you all of our lives. As a mother, even in the middle of a revolution, she has been accompanying us. When the little babies were born and we stood around the, the baptismal font and we processed up the center aisle of our churches reciting the creed, Entering into the church, into the loving arms of Mother Church. All those beautiful holidays, all those holy days, all those Christmases, all those times. Tenebrae, Holy Week, Advent, Lent. All the beautiful things that are being abandoned now. Mother Church gave that to us. And as a child, it meant everything to us. We lived Catholic. We breathed Catholic. And on many occasions... We died Catholic. When my father died at the age of 80, 87 years old, his family was all around him, singing hymns, praying the rosary, and that meant 50, 60 people. He had 100 and some grandchildren that weren't able to be in the room. But when he died, I had my hand on the shoulder of my father as he passed. Greatest man I ever knew, I had ever met. And when he died, do you know, there was a smile, not the fake sort of melodramatic smile, but there was a look of contentment on his, on his face. He had the scapular around his neck. He had a rosary in his hands. My mother had put a statue of Our Lady at the foot of his bed in the hospital, and we sang softly to him the, the great hymns and motets that he knew and loved. And he passed. And do you know what? And I give this to you as, as a gift for those of you who may be facing the loss of a loved one. Do you know when my father finally took that last breath, I could find no reason to cry. 
and I didn't. He had simply gone to God, living a faithful life as a soldier of Jesus Christ, full of love and joy and happiness that Mother Church had given him. This is how I want to die. This is how every one of us wants to die. This is what we're fighting for, friends. That moment, that moment when God calls us home. And if there is anger in our voice, in our fight, in our resistance, it is because they are trying to take that away from us. Not just us, but people who know far less than we do about the truths of the faith. I sat there for the past 10 days. Nothing Catholic was said. This synod was already condemned in 1928 formally by Pope Pius XI and Mortali Manimos. I knew that. They never said anything about with conversation, conversing with their dialogue partners about the need to invite them into the loving arms of Mother Church. And so I went up to Cardinal Cook and I asked him after a press conference, Your Eminence, do you ever say, is it necessary to say that we must become Catholic in order to be saved? Is anyone getting that message? And he said, we mustn't proselytize. We hope the church will grow by attachment, not proselytism. He's getting that from Francis. So that's the second part of what I want to give you in terms of uh, strategy when it comes to this idea of homosexuality, gay and lesbian, whatever you want to call that group, that community. You must, we must all understand that this is not the 1950s. Those poor, abandoned sinners are sinners just like we are, and nobody is giving them the truth. Nobody. Cardinal Supich just told America Magazine a couple days ago, we accompany them. We don't, we don't tell them anything about, about, we don't do condemnation, we do accompaniment. Accompany them where? To hell? How far does this accompaniment go? Eminence. And so the cardinal talking to me said, no, we don't, we don't, we don't proselytize anymore. Well, that's a shame. That's a shame, and that's a sin, and that's a crime, and we have every right before God to resist, to stand up and shout our opposition to that, and to say of our friends who are involved in a sinful lifestyle, gay and lesbian folks, as I say, it's not 1950 anymore. We're talking two, three generations where nobody in the church has catechized them. Nobody has told them there's sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. Nobody has warned them of what happens in just a few years. It's all on the catechism. You can check the catechism. We talked about that yesterday at the press conference. You can go look it up. The church still speaks about the mortal sin, the disordered homosexual act, which leads to death and can under no circumstances be accepted. It's all on the books. But they're not talking about the books. They're not talking about the rules. They're not, the church is not sharing the law, the rules, the, pun, the, the punishments, the love of why it's important for the sake of love and charity to share the truth with those who are involved in this sin. This is horrific. So don't tell me we're homophobic. We're all sinners. We are not homophobic. We are on their side. I am on the side of the gay and lesbian folks who are being misinformed, disinformed, and lied to by my church. They have a right to know the truth. And we can lead with love in telling them that there's a serious and massive crisis in our church that deprives them, that has nothing to do with accompaniment, but has everything to do with a church of abandonment. We all feel abandoned. So let's get to the specifics. <clears throat> synodality. The synod on synodality. <laughs> it's a great word, isn't it? If I hear it one more time, I'm going to put my fist through the wall. I, I just, an ill-defined word that just gets repeated like a mantra over and over again. But here's the thing, friends. Here's, here's the news flash. Guess what? Guess what this synod was all about? Synodality. It's just that bad. That's all it was. This, I would argue, is possibly the greatest revolution in the church since the spirit of, of Vatican II and the revolution of the Second Vatican Council. We are watching a massive revolution unfold right before our eyes at the very highest levels of the church. And, <laughs> 
they are dead serious when they say it's all about synodality. So we had people like, for example, Father Tom Reese. I'm sorry, he doesn't go by Father anymore. He goes by Tom. Tom Reese over in the press, uh, press hall getting rather indignant because it looked like there was going to be nothing about women or married priests or gay unions in the final document. And the answer every single time from the representatives of the Synod was the same. We are not getting into specifics at the Synod. This is about synodality. It took me, it's so stupid, it took me a while to realize that they were serious. <laughs> that that is what they mean. They mean the discussion. They mean the process, the journey, and just going together and the journey and the, you know, the spaces and all this stuff. They literally are doing this on purpose. Now, it's mind-numbingly stupid, but there's Luciferian thought behind it. Because what it does, friends, is it opens up the possibility to everyone in the whole world that everything is on the table now in the Catholic Church. Everything. Sins that cry to heaven for vengeance, possible gay unions, married priests, everything. Things that we learned as young people in Catholic schools are mortally sinful, offensive to God, are suddenly being discussed as part of the synodal process. Do you see what I mean? It's incredibly revolutionary. That's all they needed for this point, at this point was the world to know, hey, guess what? The Catholic Church has finally gotten over herself. We are talking now. That's why they keep talking about talkings and their little breakout sessions and their little round tables like kindergartners, finger painting. But it's with forethought. They want the world to know that we are discussing everything. Everything's an option. So that's important as we move into this next period then, because it's all about 2024. We knew that coming in. But it's also important to realize something else I'm going to steal my own thunder again, by saying what we saw as this synod began was what? What was dominating the headlines? Dominating the headlines was five cardinals. The whole world was talking about these five sort of up, you know, uh, irritating cardinals that were putting a little bit of a monkey wrench into the beautiful synodal process. They don't want to hear the spirit. I guess they don't like the spirit, whatever it was. That dominated the headlines. So don't let anybody, some people come in and they give these people way too much power, friends, way too much omniscience, that they're actually going to pull this off. Are they? Of course they're not going to. And the synod, at the beginning, certainly over the, as the time, as the days ticked along, we realize what happens when rightful authority stands up and resists. That dominated the headlines. So what they did, okay, we're not going to have a blessing of gay unions, we're not going to have uh, you know, deaconesses yet. We're just going to go back to plan B, which was synodality, synodality, and synodality. Because there's, there's time for that to happen, for, that, for those things to develop as, <laughs> as we move along. That's the game. That's the strategy. Plan A was to ramrod everything they possibly could. Too many good cardinals stood up, too many bishops, all of you, LifeSite News, all of us, screaming, shouting together. Never, friends, never in the history of this counter-revolution, which is what it is, have I personally seen more unanimity, more unity in opposition than what we have right now? Don't forget that. It's a massive, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I keep saying Pope Francis is the greatest unifier. He's the greatest recruiting agent we could possibly ask for. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to write him a personal letter of gratitude <laughs> for strengthening the traditional Catholic resistance throughout the whole world. I have so many friends now, friends in high places who used to think that the remnant in LifeSite News was too radical. Now they're like, hey, you doing anything for lunch later? You know, because they don't want to be associated with this either. That's a grace, that's a, that's a wonderful and powerful thing that's happening. And I want to, I just can't stand the idea of just saying it's the end of the world. Put on your tin hats, get underneath your bed and wait for the apocalypse. I, I just, I think God wants us to stay engaged. And a conference like this, of course, is all about that. Stay engaged. Come to Rome. Make sure you fight. Make sure that they see you fighting. Let them see you fighting. And especially now when we can stand behind cardinals, such as Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Muller, uh, we have a fighting chance. We're going to give them hell, if you'll forgive, my, forgive the expression. So that's the plan. And it's been going on for a long time. And we ultimately know who wins in the end. It's just a question of what do we do with this, with this moment? And what do we do with the fact that many people are going to be deceived? Many people are walking out, leaving the church forever right now. They're not coming back. Souls are being lost right now because of this stupidity that's going on here. We have an obligation to do whatever we can. That's why Cardinal Muller was here today. That's why Bishop Strickland is here today. Because we all, especially those in leadership positions, have, have an obligation before God to try to save souls 
from this, this, this uh, ambiguity at best and deceit at worst. So I want to talk about, on a, strat on, a, on a practical note now, what we're actually seeing. I want to give you what I consider to be the Rosetta Stone of understanding the synod on synodality. And no, it's, it's not the spirit. It's not pathways. It's not journey. What it is, is something that happened, and you're going to have to be patient with me. I scratched a few things down here. Something, I know some of you have heard this, but boy, oh boy, has this become clear that what we're dealing with this year, or this, at this Senate, is this. So I want you to see what you think. Yesterday, in preparation for this talk, our team went to the Domatilla Catacomb. Maybe some of you remember hearing about that catacomb. That's the largest catacomb in Rome. It has the largest underground church in Rome. 60 feet deep, 10 miles long, 20, 30, 40,000 Christians buried there, including, according to legend, or according to tradition, the daughter of St. Peter. Whether that's true, I'm not sure. But as we approached this catacomb, we went there for a very specific purpose. We saw a plaque, a very elaborate plaque, on the outside of this, this tourist attraction now. And the, track, the, the, the plaque is celebrating the 50th anniversary of something called the Pact of the Catacombs. Very official, very elaborate plaque. But there was, and some of you I'm sure have heard of the Catacombs Pact. If you haven't, here we go. But what was interesting on this plaque is it said right beneath it that it's also celebrating the 50th anniversary, this was in 2015, the 50th anniversary of Paul VI visiting the Domitilla Catacomb to, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a warm-up act for the Catacombs Pact. So what we have with the Catacombs Pact starts at the Second Vatican Council. It starts with Pope John XXIII, who was, of course, the Pope of the poor. The Pope, he wanted, he, wanted, he wanted to have a church of the poor. The Catacombs Pact is all about making the Catholic Church a church of the poor, a church for the poor. And they say poor, they don't say poor, they say poor, because it's another one of those words. It's about the poor. As if, as if the Catholic Church never knew anything about poverty and poor people for 1,965 years of her existence. I don't know that I've ever heard a bigger crock, but they can get away with this because people are dumbed down about history as well. As you all know in this room, and I need to set this up before we talk about this catacomb pact, because they're fooling the world with the talk about poor. As you all know, the Catholic Church literally invented the hospital system. You can Google that. Look it up. There's no question about it. It came out of the monastery system. The Catholic Church invented the idea of things like soup kitchens and orphanages and schools and hospital systems all over the world. I'm from the Midwest in the United States. Every town started out by a priest, usually an Austrian or a French priest, who came up on a canoe into the, into the hinterlands and started a little mission which grew into a hospital or you know, a place for people to eat and get clothed and be educated, and then became towns. The entire city of New Orleans was founded by Ursuline sisters. You go to New Orleans, everybody will admit, had it not been for the Ursuline nuns from France, there would not be a New Orleans. And when they first got there, they were colonizing it, there was a rough and tumble time, and the governor, makeshift governor, wrote back to the king of France and he said, what we need here is women. We need civilizing influences of the women. And so a few months later, the king of France sent the Ursuline nuns all bedecked in their habits. They showed up on the shore. I'm pretty sure that's not what the governor had in mind, <laughs> but that's what God had in mind, and the rest is history. So these are the great examples of it's so easy to prove the Catholic Church was, was literally sending her best and her brightest from Europe into all around the world all around the world, to, to literally die for the faith, to die for the poor. You don't preach the gospel to people who are starving or naked. The first thing the missionaries did was they learned how to feed them, and they learned how to clothe them, and they learned how to, about their customs and their culture too. And then they taught them about Jesus Christ. We know this, but millions don't. And so the catacombs pack comes in with this lie that finally the Catholic Church is going to start caring about the poor. So 60 years ago, on the evening of November 16th, just down the road from where we are now, 40 Catholic bishops gathered together in the catacombs of St. Domitilla to swear an oath 
Now, these are council fathers. These are important guys under the influence of, of incredibly influential people such as Eve Congar, uh, Bishop Helder Kamara, and so forth. Now, they, 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 they swore an oath under the guise of this concern for the poor to change the Catholic Church forever by transforming her into a church of the poor, that it would abandon the church's doctrinal claim of re religious supremacism as the only true religion and sole means of salvation. That's the problem with the Catholic Church. That's why this synod is happening, because there is one religion that claims to be the true religion outside of which there is no salvation. That is exclusive, and what we're talking about today now is inclusive. Everything has to be inclusive and equity, right? Catholic Church has, it's a little bit like what they, the problem they had with a guy like Donald Trump. He was going to make one of the nations, one of the countries strong, so it wouldn't have to be absorbed by this globalist experiment. Same thing happening now to the Catholic Church. It has to be leveled. It cannot have doctrines and dogmas and of exclusivity, like no women priests, like no receiving Holy Communion uh, for people who are public sinners. So they went down into the catacombs. It's a weird thing. Sounds like something out of a Twilight Zone episode, but it's very, very true. The Mass was celebrated shortly before the end of the Second Vatican Council, a couple, a couple days before, weeks before. And I asked the guide yesterday when we were in this catacomb if this is it. She knew right away, yes, this is where the Mass was said the night, so shortly before the Second Vatican Council ended, when these council fathers went down to swear an oath to change the Catholic Church forever. Now, this is not something that's unrelated for why, for, from the reason that we're all here in this room today. What we saw here this week is the completion or the attempted, the next stage of the catacombs pact. And what's very important to realize is that what this group of, cardinal, of council fathers was all about was undermining the traditionalists, the conservatives at Vatican II, the Archbishop Lefebvre, for example. You've heard the story about how they worked for months and months on the schema, and they were all traditional, and they were quite good, and they were quite solid, and then they were all just thrown away, and something new was put in place that ended up being the 16 documents of Vatican II. Well, these are the guys that were influential in having those original conservative Catholic schemas thrown away, the working documents for the, for the Second Vatican Council, and they ended up with what we have now. They were at war with them, and they refused to sign documents that were sort of orthodox and ready to go, at the, at the time of the Second Vatican Council. So they go down under the ground, they celebrate this Mass, and the liturgy concludes in the dim light, this is how it's described even in newspapers, uh, in accounts, concluded in the dim light of the vaulted fourth century chamber, each of the prelates came up to the altar and affixed his name to a brief but passionate manifesto that pledged them all to try to live according to the ordinary manner of people, poor people, in all that concerns housing, and means of transportation uh, and related matters. So when you see Pope Francis, for example, with the little black briefcase and the black work shoes, that's all part of that. We have to have men of the people now. The church is being literally pulled down off its throne. First they uncrown Christ, and then they, now they're, they're in the process of trying to uncrown uh, the church itself to make it a very egalitarian sort of uh, social and public uh, uh, institution that takes care of poor people, and that's about it. Now, the signatories of the Catacomb Pact vowed to renounce personal possessions, regal vestments, names and titles that express prominence, such as Monsignor, Pope even was on the docket, and they said that they would make advocating for the poor and powerless the focus of the church's ministry. All of this, they said, quote, we will seek, in all of this, we will seek collaborators in ministry so that we can be animators, wait for it, animators according to the Spirit. Rather than dominators according to the world. We will try to make ourselves as humanly present and welcoming as possible, and we will show ourselves to be open to all, no matter what their religion started with 40 signers of the Catacomb Pact. By the time they had promoted it, 500 council fathers and bishops had signed this Catacomb Pact. It became known shortly thereafter as the Pact of the Catacombs. During the reign of Pope John Paul, what do you know? The Pact of the Catacombs disappeared. It is barely mentioned in the extensive histories of Vatican II. And while copies of the text are, are in circulation, no one knows what happened to the original 
document, which was written by one Helder Camara, Bishop Helder Camara. Keep that name in, in mind. He's a Brazilian bishop. He was accused throughout his career of being a communist. He admitted to being a socialist. And he's a liberation theologian. Pope Francis then comes along. He's made, Jorge Mario Bergoglio made pope. He brings it all back immediately. In fact, he made Hector Camara, the author of the Catacombs Pact, a venerable servant of God. In 2016, shortly after then, 2016, a day-long seminar in Rome took place marking the anniversary of the Catacombs Pact. Cardinal Walter Casper told the Washington Post that Pope Francis's program is to a high degree what the Catacombs Pact was. The Catacomb Pact is everywhere now in discussion in Rome, end quote. Cardinal Casper, who was, by the way, at, this, at the Synod this week, he's still, he's still knocking around, he mentions the Catacombs Pact in his book, Mercy, Essence of the Gospel, and Key to Christian Life. I'm going through all this so that you can go away from this conference knowing exactly what the foundation of the Synod on Synodality actually is. The Washington Post 2016 reports notes that in a few days, the 50th anniversary of both the Catacombs Pact and Vatican II approached. This remarkable episode has finally begun to emerge from the shadows with the, with, with the coronation or with the election of Pope Francis, of Bergoglio. <laughs> now, thanks in part to a circle of theologians and historians, especially in German, Germany, and yes, I'm quoting, who began talking and writing more publicly about the Catacombs Pact. The effort took a major step forward later that month when the, when the, uh, po the Pontifical Urban University, right here overlooking the Vatican, hosted a day-long seminar on the document's legacy. It has the odor of communism, admits Brother Heisterhoff of the Society of the Divine Word, the missionary community that is in charge of the Domitilla Catacombs to this day. Quote, what the catacombs really represented... Uh, he says, uh, Heisterhoff says, was a church without power, a church that featured what Francis has praised as a convincing witness, a radical vision of simplicity and service that the Pope says is needed for the Catholic Church today. In other words, a church that will be neutralized, marginalized, stripped of her moral authority, and eventually absorbed into the one world religion since she is essentially now agreeing to swap her divine mandate to baptize all nations in exchange for a mess of pottage called the Brotherhood of Man. Now, some of you were here, with, I was here during the Amazon Synod, when Bishop Kreutler led a group of Synod fathers down to attend Mass, <laughs> you guessed it, in the Domitilla Catacomb again, 7 a.m. in Rome, early in the morning, at the exact spot where the original catacomb pact took place 60 years ago. The celebration was presided over by, Claudio, by Cardinal Claudio Humes. Now, this is the one that those of you who were, I was at the Vatican Press Hall when Francis was first elected. And right over here, not, not too far from where we are now, Paul VI Audience Hall, he addressed the press for the first time. And during that address, he talked about how Cardinal Humes had told him, told Francis, you must make this a church of the poor. And, and Francis quoted him as saying that. Right out of the gate, one of the very first public statements Francis makes then is referenced right back to the Catacombs Pact. The event took place privately at the Amazon Synod. No press participation was allowed. And at the end of the Mass, all participants signed a declaration again. And although this new declaration will be based on the original 1965, or was based on the original 1965 document, it was called the Catacombs Pact for a Common Home. The commemoration of the Catacombs Pact at the Amazon Synod reinforced Francis' personal commitment to enlist the church in the effort to establish a new social order throughout the world. Exactly, friends, as paragraph 10 of the original Catacombs Pact vowed to do, and I quote, this is paragraph 10 from the Catacombs Pact, signed by Council Fathers at Vatican II. We will do our utmost so that those responsible for our government and for our public services make and put into practice 
laws, structures, and social institutions required by justice and charity, equality and the harmonic and holistic development of all men and women, and by this means bring about the advent of another new order, a new social order worthy of the sons and daughters of man. 1965 at the close of the Second Vatican Council, otherwise known as the formal rejection of the kingship of Christ. They signed an oath essentially rejecting the social kingship of Jesus Christ. Now what had happened just 30 years before this, when you had communism on the one hand and Nazism on the other hand, crushing what was left of Catholic Europe, and you had a little pope in Rome named Pius XI, whose solution to the entire chaotic world war was the social kingship of Jesus Christ. He established a feast day, the feast of Christ the King. He wrote several encyclicals, most famous of which is Quas Primus, telling the world, turn to Christ the King or you will die. The world will be destroyed. That was his answer. It wasn't dialogue, Pius XI. It wasn't listening. It was the social reign of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One little footnote that might be interesting. Bishop Helder Camara, Camara of Brazil, who is the author of the Catacombs Pact, was not present in 1965 in the Catacomb Domitilla when they first signed it. And do you know why? He was in the Vatican working on a redaction of Gaudium et Spes. He was a co-author of Gaudium et Spes, a co-author of some of the documents of Vatican II. You have to, friends. We have to, we have to. I, I agree with Cardinal Burke that to whatever extent is possible, we don't want the enemies of the church to wrestle Vatican II away completely. If there's anything in Vatican II that's binding, we accept it with all of our hearts and souls as faithful Catholics. But you simply cannot look at what's happening and avoid the revolution of Vatican II, avoid the spirit of Vatican II, a spirit which in 2013, February 14, 2013, one of the last messages that, that Benedict gave to the world when he addressed the Roman Curia was that the spirit of Vatican II, what he called the media council, had destroyed the church, destroyed the seminaries, destroyed the liturgy. And his contention was we have to get back to the authentic Vatican II. But the point is, he readily admits that something terrible came out of that council and destroyed the church, destroyed the mass in her human element. So Kamara was instrumental in writing the, the most controversial document, arguably, in the Second Vatican Council. Now, at this synod on synodality, it happened again. On October 12, 2023, right here in Rome, right in the Vatican, the particip participants of the Synod on Synodality spent the afternoon away from the Synod discussions and back down in the catacombs, where they were each given a booklet this time, a prayer booklet for their prayer service, which included the entire text of the Catacombs Pact. They're very serious about what they're trying to do here, friends. And we have to address them equally, I think, just as seriously in return. Understand what they are and what they're trying to do, and perhaps we can do something, even humanly speaking, to defeat what they're doing. Because the thing is, you all are aware that on the, I was so grateful to Cardinal Muller today for once again bringing up Davos, once again bringing up the World Economic Forum. If you're not paying attention to what's happening there, um, you're missing the, the, the plot. Because he mentioned, his, his eminence mentioned Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum. Now he sent Cardinal per Peter Turkson to give his personal blessing to the World Economic Forum on the 50th anniversary. Klaus Schwab cites one of his most important inspirations in his life as a young man, one Bishop Helder Camara of Brazil. He visited, Klaus Schwab visited Bishop Camara in Brazil, was massively influenced by this bishop who promised to transform the Catholic Church had Bishop Kamara come and speak at the World Economic Forum in the early 1970s. Do you see the connection? Do you see the connection? Everything that's happening at the Synod has to do with this revolution. This love affair between Davos and the Vatican 
between the synod and synodality, between the pontificate of Pope Francis and the World Economic Forum and the Bill Gates Foundation and now the Bill Clinton Foundation. Pope Francis goes and visits Bill Clinton, one of the biggest pro-abort, anti-Catholic, pro-gay marriage presidents in our history, and he visits him in front of all of us. He puts it right in our face. As Catholics, as Christian Americans, he speaks with him, he honors him, and then sends representatives to Davos, where they are planning, as his eminence said just this morning, on transhumanizing us. First, we're going to have wearables, and then we're going to have inserts in our brains. I realize this sounds insane because they are, so why is the Vatican partnering with them in this godless project? And I will close on this, friends, because I hope we're all beginning to see how obvious it is. The fight that you're involved with, that LifeSight is involved with, that the remnant is involved with, that Cardinal Muller is in, the Bishop, the Bishop Strickland is involved with, that fight, and many, many more people, Cardinal Burke, all around the world, is the most important fight in the world today. Because all the efforts of the human powers on this earth right now have one plan, one agenda, and that's to flatten the Catholic Church, to flatten it. In 1963, Pope Paul VI himself removed his own crown and set it on the altar in St. Peter's. He said he was going to give it to the poor you see what I'm saying? The church is signing a, its own death warrant, humanly speaking, but more importantly, it is making an evil Faustian bargain with the builders of a new world order to make sure that Christ does not stand in the way of this diabolical enterprise to set up a kingdom of Satan in this world. Everything we've seen at this synod is all about tearing down the Catholic Church, making sure she doesn't stand in the way of this effort to kill babies, to hack up the private parts of our children, to destroy their brains, to destroy their sexuality, to give them no hope, millions of them, to be deprived of Holy Mother Church, of her embrace, of her grace, of her sacraments. Do you know what that means? It means that our efforts to stop this with the angels in heaven and with Our Lady and with grace, our willingness to suffer for the church is the most important thing we can do. Because once the church is gone, friends, who and what is going to stand in the way of the diabolical enterprise that they have in store for us? They already enlisted the, the aid of Pope Francis when they wanted to shut down the world with their COVID experiment. And they sent him out there like Laurence Olivier with spotlights and cinematography and music into the piazza of St. Peter to tell the whole world that the church would bend a knee to the new world order and lock every one of us down and lock the churches of the world. This is going to happen again. We're not just playing games here, friends. Us keeping the faith, as Bishop Strickland was talking about earlier, turning to Jesus as Cardinal Muller was saying, nothing is more important than this. Make sure you're not deceived. The church is not ours to save. Christ will save his church. God will save his church. Don't confuse yourself with the saviors of the church, because we're not that. But we are the instruments, the human instruments, that if we hang on, and if we, like the ten just men of Sodom, if we will stand with God and say, we stand with you, he will work the salvation of the world. He will defend us. He will defend our children. But we have to be like the ten just men of Sodom. And we have to remember, friends, to keep that faith that we learn from our mothers, that that's what this is all about. It's not, it's not complex. It's the simple faith that we, that we imbibe with our mother's breast milk, the faith we have to love the church enough to stand with her, enough to suffer for her. And I think we can do that. I think we have the stuff to do that. We may not be great martyrs, but I think we're here because we love the faith. And we're keeping the old faith. We're keeping the traditions. We're keeping the Latin mass because we love the faith. And that's all we have to do. Make that commitment. 
to love the faith enough to stand with her. And it's not going to be easy. But did anybody ever think it was easy for Mary Magdalene and St. John to stand at the foot of the cross? Don't you see? When Jesus Christ died after saying he was God, he dies on the cross. There must have been many people who were scandalized by that and left the faith, lost the faith in him. But they regained it again. And the main thing is we look at that first crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his, his body, and now we're looking at the crucifixion of the mystical body of Christ, and we know how to do this. We stand with Magdalene. We stand with John. We know the church will rise again. And when Christ saves his church, just make sure you're still there. You're still in the church, no matter what, when he comes back and saves his church. And I told you I'm out of time. I told you I, would, I, would, I just want to conclude with a hopeful note Noting once again, something that we all knew from our catechism, that in the beginning, in the beginning of this thing, what, what did we see? We saw a crucified man. We saw a, a, a symbol, a cross, a symbol of absolute despair and desperation and execution turn into the greatest symbol of hope the world has ever seen. And from that cross, from that moment, Christ sends out 12, just 12 apostles, bishops, to go out into the world and spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Many people following, many children following the lead of those bishops ended up lion food. They ended up singing to lions as they were being torn to pieces. Parents watching their children be killed right here in this town, right in this city. And from that is born the greatest civilization the world has ever seen. The greatest love story that man has ever fathomed, has ever conceived of. Following Jesus Christ to the cross and beyond to heaven. Today, my friends, as I said from my personal experience, we have more than 12. The number of bishops, the number of, of, of priests is, is exponentially larger. I just learned from my friends in France that after Traditionis Custodis, the only thing that has happened is there are more traditional Latin masses in France because God is standing with us. We are standing with him is most important. And if we can demonstrate that, he will stand with us. He will take care of us. We have more bishops every day, it seems. Cardinals now who are standing, who are going to go out into the world and restore all things in Jesus Christ. And I'll leave you with one thought. Standing with these men, with these few bishops, with these courageous cardinals, princes of the church, <laughs> is not a duty. It's not a duty. We tell the stories of the Cristeros, don't we? We tell the stories of the English martyrs. We tell the, tell the stories of the Vandans. We tell it to our children. We tell those stories someday. They may tell our story. They may tell your story and your children's stories. It's not a duty to stand with these princes of the church and to stand with Christ. It is hands down and without a doubt the greatest honor of our lives. And I'm proud to stand with you as we all do that today. Thank you. God bless you.